My name is Brian Cannon. I'm the youth minister at St. Paul's Catholic Church. It's been my joy and my honor to be there for the past seven years. That's right, I started when I was 15 years old. <laughs> it doesn't get any funnier, so I might as well laugh at that one. <laughs> I do have a confession to make right off the bat. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have a little Southern Baptist preacher in my head, and he wants to talk tonight, so if I get a little fired up, and I say something that maybe doesn't jive with where your heart is at, or, or maybe that you don't necessarily agree with 100%, just keep listening. That's all I would ask, just have an open heart, because one of two things will happen. One, you'll find out I'm not all that bad of a guy, and there's some things that maybe we can connect with, and you can come a little bit closer to God. Or two, you'll really hate everything I have to say, and that's kind of fun, too. So it's going to be one of those two things. It's a beautiful monsoon day here in Arizona. And so tonight, I come to you on the wings of the word. And the wings of the word are beating loudly in the treetops. The Lord's word is howling in the wind, flashing in the belly of the cloud. And we believe this word. And we believe that this word is the living Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the Lord of heaven and earth, to the glory of God the Father. And we believe in a God who loves us. We believe in a God who picked up the clay from the ground, formed it into us, and said, this is my breath, it's yours. We believe in a God who pours out blood and says, this is my blood. It pulses in your veins. That's the God that we believe in. So if you leave here with nothing else that Brian Cannon from St. Paul said tonight, leave here knowing that we have a God who loves us. And loves us without limit. You wouldn't know it around here lately. In our community. The current political fervor in our society has contributed to a great poverty of compassion, even among believers. As a community of daughters and sons of God, we are called to live the mandate of Jesus' love, Jesus' love for the others and to accept that those others may not be who we want them to be. You see, we don't get to choose who to love, because that's not really love, that's preference. To practice true and unconditional love requires patience, listening, respect, healing, and a celebration that each of us has the dignity of being a beautiful child of God, formed from the same clay, breathing the same breath, and pulsing the same blood. Our community needs the healing power of this overwhelming love, and we can be the ones to bring it. We can trust that God's way of love overcomes every economic fear. It overcomes every cultural fear. Do we believe? Do we trust in Jesus Christ only when it's safe and comfortable? In a time of great in-your-face opposition, do we still have room to live a life of faith? Our faith. Our humble faith, not our t-shirt faith. Not our in-your-face faith. Our boots on the ground, walking the life of a Christian faith. Our family has become fractured. Our faith has become a servant to our particular politics. We have allowed the hyperpolarization that we are experiencing to nudge us into twisting our faith into justification for doing things our way. I wish 
sisters and brothers, I wish that we did not print in God we trust on our money. Just putting it there does not make it so. What would it look like if we really trusted God instead of our bank accounts, our military, our government, our comfort and security, or even our church? What would it really look like? Give to everyone who asks of you. From the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is the clear teaching of Jesus Christ. Word for word from the gospel. You know, you can't swing a cat around here lately without hitting at least a baker's dozen of people that have um, an opinion about immigration. And we hear all the reasons for why they feel the way that they do. When you think about all of the things that you've heard in the past few months, all the reasons that someone would give you about why they feel the way they feel about immigration, and these feelings are strong, amen? They're strong feelings. If you think about any reason that somebody would give you about why they feel the way they feel about immigration, how often is a gospel value at the top of the list? We can't afford to have undocumented people. We can't afford not to have undocumented people. Punish them and deport them. Do it, but do it the right way. Amnesty, security, prosperity, or this one that drives me up the wall every single time I hear it. What part of illegal don't you understand? How condescending. What part of illegal don't you understand? Well, if it's speeding on the 101, you know, no, take down the cameras because that's not the law that I want to have applied because it applies to me. That's illegal too. As believers, we are called not to put economics first, not to put our fears first, but to put God first. Before money, before security, before politics, even before being right. First Corinthians. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my sisters and brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with the wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be empty of its meaning. In Phoenix, Arizona, do we love one another anymore? If you look at the message boards on azcentral.com, the answer is no. Nope. We don't. If you ever want to depress yourself, for an afternoon, find anything related to immigration, post it on azcentral.com, and go through the comments. If you ever want to depress yourself for a day, what is my part truly faithful to? If we're talking about scriptural faithfulness, central to its expression is hospitality. 
to the stranger. The Jesus of the Gospels draws us into a lifestyle of loving the stranger and recognizing the stranger as the very presence of the living God. If we consider the context of the shouting match that we're having about immigration in our community today, we must be able to see the poverty of compassion and hospitality, not just for the undocumented, but for the Keith Olbermans and the Glenn Becks of the world too, and for you and me. Do you love me? As I stand here, you looking at me tonight, do you love me? I'm not advocating for any particular set of solutions to this complex set of problems tonight. I'm just asking if you love me. And if you love them. Whoever them is. Exodus 22:21. You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19:34 echoes and expands on the Exodus teaching. The alien who resides among you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Remember in the Gospels when Jesus was first born and Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had to pick up and go to Egypt to flee the persecution of Herod. I didn't check their documents. I'm not sure if they were in order. New Testament letter to the Hebrews we hear. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have entertained angels unaware. <coughs> In scripture, the other, or the stranger, is a person of vulnerability. We depend on God for everything. We need God in our lives more than we need our next breath. God's love and kindness flow into us each moment giving us life. God does not count the cost of the life that God gives. God does not count the cost of the life that God gives. That's why he hung on a cross for us. The word cost should not be in our vocabulary. The word sacrifice should. The stranger, by definition, is an outsider and may be excluded from the networks which insiders rely on for the satisfaction of their daily needs. Therefore, Christian teaching about hospitality insists that strangers be treated the same as insiders, and so the outsider becomes our neighbor. The stranger is created in the image of God and shares the same rights as the rest of us simply because of their humanness. In welcoming the stranger, the people of God are required to establish justice on their behalf. Given the vulnerability of undocumented migrants in the United States, this form of love must shine through, and it must shine through us. In welcoming the stranger, our love seeks out new and transforming relationships. In scripture, the stranger often appears as a herald, or one who brings news. Therefore, as God's people welcome the stranger, not only because we're commanded to do so, but because through their lives and their stories, we hear the good news of God's love and faithfulness to all of humanity. In the presence of the stranger, God is calling us to new horizons of love, communication, and especially healing. Do we believe? Do we trust in Jesus Christ only when it is safe and convenient? I love coming here. I love being in the presence of the Lord in this place, but let's be real. This is easy. 
Remember how hard it was to stand in the presence of a dying Jesus at the foot of the cross. Almost everybody ran away. He had three supporters there and one was nailed. This is a little bit of an upper room, isn't it? Christ is being crucified out there. This experience is meant to strengthen us for that experience. We cannot do it alone. We need to be a part of a community. And if you've noticed the state of our community lately, our community needs healing. We have to have healing. Sometimes people think that healing is going back to the way that things were before. And that's not what healing is. That would mean that suffering was wasted. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he carried those nail marks in his hands. His best friends, when he was resurrected, didn't recognize him. If you saw your best friend walking down the street, you would recognize your best friend walking down the street. Jesus' friends didn't recognize him. Why? Because you don't recognize the acorn in the oak tree. Jesus had experienced a profound healing in his life, and he became a new creation. That's what our community needs. We need to be healed to move on, to have this suffering that we're experiencing now become redemptive, become life-giving, become a resurrection. My favorite story of healing takes place at the Pool of Bethesda. Now, at this pool, there are five porticos. And a good Jew at the time of Jesus would know the significance of the number five. If you started off a sentence and said, the five, they would conclude books of the law. The Pentateuch. Five, first five books of the Bible. So this is the context in which this healing pool resides. I mean, that this is the context. The entire law is focused here in this place on healing. And there was a man that was at this pool for 30-something years. And you can picture whatever crotchety old man lives in your neighborhood. No offense to any crotchety old men that are in attendance tonight. But there was a guy that was laying there for, I think it's 38 years. And what would happen at this pool is that sometimes the waters would get stirred up. And they believed that when the waters got stirred up, that was the time to get in the pool to accept healing. I've been to Iceland, and uh, that's where the word geyser comes from. And I went to that place, and uh, right before this big geyser erupts, you can see the waters start to tremble. And it's not a far leap if you don't know what's going on geothermically to say that there is something going on here. I'm not sure I would jump in. And neither was this guy that was laying by the pool for 38 years. Jesus comes. And he says to the man, you know, do you want to be healed? And on the surface level, that's the easiest question in the world. Well, yeah, duh, I would like to be healed. It's not a stupid question. A lot of times in life we go through, we'd rather not be healed, really. We'd rather not become that new creation in God. We'd rather do things our way. We'd rather trust in ourselves. <clears throat> so it's a real question that Jesus asks of this man. And in the King James Version, which I'm not a huge fan of, it's a bad translation, but it's got an interesting line. Jesus asks, wilt thou be made whole? Isn't that what we want for our community? To be whole again. So Jesus asks the man, and the man says, Well, I have nobody to put me into the water. And I can just hear Jesus in his sarcastic self, I'm sure he was, say, That's not what I asked you. And the man says, Well, every time the waters get stirred up, somebody cuts me off and goes ahead of me and doesn't, I can't get into the water. And, and I can hear Jesus saying, That's not what I ask you. Do you really? want to be healed. And the man really wants to be healed. And Jesus gives him three directions to be healed. And I think that these are the three directions 
that we as a community can take. This first direction is a single word. Rise. Did you see my little box car outside? I have, I have one of those organ donor license plates and it just says rise on it. And people are like, what's that about? This is what it's about. This is like my favorite healing story. Rise. Now, I'm no English major, but I was taught that when you give a command like that, there's a word in front of that word that's implied, and that word that's implied is you. You rise. You can't rise anybody else. You rise. The second instruction was pick up your mat. Because our suffering is redemptive. We don't forget who we, who we are. We don't forget what we went through. We don't forget the exodus. 40 years in the desert, we remember that. The Jewish people in their Seder meal, they commemorate that exodus. They remember that at the Passover. Jesus walks around with the scars. Pick up your mat is another way of saying, pick up your cross. And the third command, let's go. The Jewish people, when they would move on from a place like, one of my favorite stories was uh, they would erect a, a stone. And so they called this, this stone Ebenezer. And so, it, the, the word Ebenezer means God has brought us thus far. It was, where are we going from here? Rise. Pick up your mat. And go. I would like to end uh, this reflection with a quote. As a quote from Ronald Rollheiser who I admire quite a bit. And he says, very few things, I believe, are more needed today in both society and the church than this capacity for understanding and forgiveness. To continue to offer others genuine love and understanding in the face of opposition and hatred constitutes the ultimate social, political, ecclesial, moral, religious, and human challenge. Sometimes church people try to single out one particular moral issue as the litmus test as to whether or not someone is a true follower of Jesus. If there is to be a litmus test, let it be this one. Can you continue to love those who misunderstand you, who oppose you, who are hostile towards you, who hate you, and who threaten you without being paralyzed, callous, or condescending? We're going to sing a song together called All Are Welcome. And to me it has a double meaning, some of the words. It opens, let us build a house where love can dwell. And that's an invitation. Let us build a house. But I also kind of like to think of it, I'm a protester at heart. It's sort of a protest song. Let us build a house where love can dwell. Let us. So let's have our hearts open to this healing in our community. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And remember the one thing you spoke about is God loves you. Thank you, amen. <laughs> Let us build a house where love can dwell. And all can safely live.
rock of faith and bones of grace. In the love of Christ and division, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak, and words are strong and true. Faith in Jesus, oh.